Total knee arthroplasty is arguably one of the most um, instrumented surgeries today. You have alignment guides and surgical navigation and even robotics. However, the um, soft tissue balance is still an art. It's, the surgeon still relies on his intuition and his own uh, expertise in trying to uh, arrive at the optimal balance for each uh, patient. Uh, it begins by, uh, it began by using uh, spacer blocks, which were some of the earliest uh, balancing devices. And these are still sometimes used by surgeons who do a measured resection. Uh, and surgeons that do gap balancing prefer some sort of mechanical tensioners. And these range from uh, laminar spreaders to devices that have been uh, designed specifically for certain instruments or certain implant manufacturers. So uh, my interest in electronic ligament balancing began more than uh, 20 years ago. And what we did was we took a tibial tray trial and we instrumented this tibial tray trial with load cells. So in a sense, it was like, it behaved like a space or block, but it had forces on the uh, force sensors inside the uh, tibial tray. And you could now measure forces as you range the knee in flexion extension, that would give you a sense of the imbalance uh, in the knee. Uh, since then, a company called Synvasive developed an, an, a, a similar device called the eLibra, where they put sensors in the tibial insert and they, uh, they used a, a, a device that was fixed to the femur and you could rotate the femur to dial in the appropriate uh, femoral rotation and make your uh, posterior femoral cut. Uh, more recently, OrthoSensor has uh, put in the sensors, has put in force sensors in their uh, tibial inserts. And uh, these sensors measure the forces in the medial and lateral compartments with the assumption that if the forces are equal, then the knee joint is balanced. Um, these sensors are specific to the implant design and they're not universal and have been, uh, have, uh, have been, have been in use for several years now. So the problem with four sensors we quickly realized was that the surgeon who was doing distraction, uh, using tensioners for distraction was actually looking at the gap and didn't know how to translate the force, forces that were being measured into a surgical technique, a change in the surgical technique or a change in the bone cut. So what we did was we designed a uh, expanding device that was pneumatically operated and applied a constant pressure or a constant force inside the knee joint and measured the gap and measured the angle or the imbalance uh, that was more in line with the surgeon's visual analysis. And we designed it so that you can measure traditional balance, which is done at zero and 90 degrees, the so-called static balance can measure dynamic balance over the entire range of motion. We, in addition to medial lateral balance, we were also interested in balance in the anterior posterior uh, direction. And we wanted to make the uh, device universal so it could be used with measured resection or with gap balancing. So I'm just going to show you an animation of some examples of how this can be used. Uh, surgeons that typically do the femur first, and these are commonly measured resection surgeons, um, can use this device at the end of their surgery. So here's an example of a knee um, that's tight in the medial and posterior direction. And what you're seeing the display on the right is uh, the sensors that are uh, recording the tilt between the top plate and the bottom plate and showing that there's a tightness in the medial compartment uh, in the medial collateral ligament. In such a case, the surgeon can go in and do a release and watch the correction as he performs the release and then check the balance again, assuming that the release is adequate. So you don't have to keep releasing and testing. You can do it in real time as you're releasing the knee. Uh, some surgeons prefer the tibia first approach, especially the surgeons that, are, uh, that believe in gap balancing. The tibia first approach even before you make your femoral cut, you can, if you want, balance the ligaments. And if you don't um, want to balance the ligaments, uh, 
before you do your cut and you want to balance the ligaments by making the femoral cut, what you can do is now make the cut based on the tilt and correct the femoral rotation in, uh, before you make um, uh, any ligament uh, releases. So um, some surgeons not only want to balance the median and lateral compartments, but also want the need to have a certain envelope of laxity. They don't want the knee to be too tight. And these surgeons will range the knee in varus valgus in addition to flexion extension to see how much laxity the patient will have postoperatively. And so the device also gives you a measure of what the varus valgus laxity is of that knee. Um, a, a less uh, a balance in the AP direction is, is not commonly uh, addressed. And that's because it's difficult to see the imbalance in the AP direction. And here's a knee that uh, looks extremely well balanced in the mediolateral direction, but you can see it's tight in the posterior direction. So there's about a 4.6 degrees of tilt in the posterior direction. And that's really difficult to see because it's, uh, you, you cannot see that tilt uh, in, in the, uh, through the surgical approach. And five degrees of tilt is very difficult to, to notice, but the, de the device actually is very sensitive and picks this up. Uh, there are many ways that you can tackle uh, tightness, a, a knee that's tight posteriorly. And some surgeons will actually put in a thinner insert so that they get enough laxity in, the, in, in a draw test with the knee flexed. Uh, other surgeons will try and release the, uh, the PCL from the femoral attachment. And you can do that with the device still in place. And I don't recommend this technique, but one surgeon actually was pie crusting the PCL and then watching the correction and knew when to stop. So we now have, for the first time, the ability to measure and record balance in multiple ways intraoperatively. What we're doing is now linking the intraoperative balance to postoperative function. And our hope is that we might be able to identify clinical outcomes that are positive and actually come up with patterns of balance that are appropriate for each patient. When I started research in total knee arthroplasty, uh, it wasn't quite as successful as it was uh, here, uh, today. And some of the problems were that we were facing were stiff knees uh, postoperatively. Where was an issue at that time in, in polyethylene? Um, uh, implant loosening was uh, more common than it is today. And there were, and there were cases of osteopenia or uh, stress shielding. The underlying uh, mechanism for all of these uh, so-called complications were knee forces. So what we decided was to actually measure knee forces in uh, patients. Uh, after knee replacement. And in 2004, Dr. Caldwell implanted uh, the world's first uh, electronic knee. And this uh, electronic knee had a microprocessor, had sensors, had uh, an internal coil that could charge the prosthesis, and had a, a, an antenna that would transmit uh, the data. The way this device worked is that an external coil would generate current in the internal coil and power the prosthesis, once the electronics were powered up, any forces being transmitted across the tray were measured by sensors inside the stem. And then the data was then transmitted wirelessly to a computer that could read uh, the data in real time. Uh, so we collected knee forces over a whole range of activities over uh, 15 years. And uh, we started off by post-operative day one. And since patients have different weights, we reported the results as a fraction of uh, body weight. So you can see that just lifting a patient's leg passively, you do generate forces in the knee. And when the patient does it actively, there's even more force. And when the patient puts, takes his first few steps, even on day one, he's putting more than his entire body weight on that knee. Uh, we monitored knee forces over several years and we found that they began to plateau by about six months. Uh, we looked at other uh, common activities of daily living, climbing up and down stairs, getting up from a chair, deep uh, flexion exercises like the lunge and even uh, kneeling. Uh, 
Uh, we looked at exercise equipment, uh, stationary bike, and even uh, upright bikes uh, in the laboratory, and obviously heavily instrumented with force plates and motion analysis equipment. Um, for outdoor activities, we looked at um, golf and we looked at uh, tennis. Now, when you take all this data together, um, we also looked at indoor exercise equipment and essentially put the patients through pretty much every uh, equipment that you can find in a gym. Uh, and plotting all the uh, data on one chart, you can see where these knee forces rank in terms of um, uh, risk to the prosthesis, assuming that high forces are bad for, uh, for, the, um, for implant survival. And some of, some of these results were intuitive. We knew that jogging and tennis were high impact sports, but some of them were not intuitive. We didn't realize that golfing, even though it's not a high impact force, you can put forces on your forward knee that uh, exceed four times body weight. And on the safe side, we were pleasantly surprised at biking and kneeling, uh, which although we thought would have higher forces on the knee didn't have as high uh, forces as we were expecting. Now, obviously these are laboratory exercises and this isn't road biking uh, outside the lab. Uh, we next looked at uh, modification of force. Uh, could we reduce or modify forces by using orthotics or unloading braces? Uh, we even taught patients how to change their gait so that they could reverse the medial compartmental forces for example, that associate uh, with a, med a medial thrust gain. And finally, we looked at uh, rehab and equipment that would, um, uh, that would be safe for the patients to exercise in. And one example is the so-called anti-gravity treadmill. So this treadmill has a pressurized chamber and the pressure in the chamber lifts the patient up. And by adjusting the, the pressure, you can adjust the amount of force that the patient walks with uh, um, on, on the treadmill. So you can exercise patients at say a partial body weight of 25%. And so we looked at uh, a whole host of uh, treadmill uh, speeds and treadmill slopes. And we correlated all of these with uh, the knee forces, which is on the Y axis is multiples of body weight. And we came up with the regression equation that could predict the knee force just based on the, on the speed of the treadmill with a, a prob, with a probability of over 75%. Now, what can you do with the data apart from just measuring uh, the forces? Uh, one, one way of broadening the application of the data beyond the patients that had these electronics knee because we could not do a large study was to use the data to drive computer models. So we developed a finite element model of a total knee replacement. And we took the data from patients, for example, in this patient, he's walking on a treadmill uh, with fluoroscopic data. And so we're now capturing not only the motion of the implants, but also the forces being applied. And we can use that now as input into our finite element model, which um, takes snapshots of all these activities and looks at, for example, in this case, polyethylene stresses. So despite the fact that I said that lunge had low forces uh, on the tibial tray, but it turns out that if at this flexion angle of 136 degrees, and this is not a high flex design, therefore the rim, the posterior rim of the femoral condyles are now digging into the polyethylene with the potential to cause risk of damage to the polyethylene. And as another example, uh, we used uh, the same uh, model, but included bone and looked at uh, stresses in, in, in the bone. And uh, by looking at the stresses in the bone, we could find out what volume of bone was being stressed to the point above its threshold for fatigue and might put the, um, that particular patient at risk for tibial subsidence. Now, there's hundreds of models of, um, of knees, uh, replaced and natural knees, uh, ranging from just simple models of a knee joint 
all the way up to um, all the way up to um, models of the entire uh, body. And uh, these models, even for activities as simple as walking, sometimes predict uh, knee forces that range from two times body weight all the way up to seven times body weight. So obviously, all of these models can't be, um, can't be accurate. So what we decided to do was make our data sets publicly available. So we released uh, all the patient's medical imaging, including pre-op MRI, pre-op CT scan, post-op CT scan, the computer models of the implants, all the motion analysis data, EMG, and even the force plates and force sensors that we were measuring, and made them publicly available uh, on, on a website at Stanford. The, the, the goal was to encourage, uh, to encourage uh, students of, um, that were developing models um, to validate the, the accuracy of their models. And what, the way we did it was we hosted annual grand challenges. And every year we would release all the data that we had except for the knee forces. And um, musculoskeletal modeling teams from all over the world would send in their predictions. And at the, at the end of the year, we would pick the winner that came closest to the actual experimental data that was measured. And uh, you can see the amount of interest that we've had uh, across the globe in terms of downloading our data and competing in this grand challenge. And we've actually had six of them so far. Um, unfortunately, you can see that uh, India is underrepresented, at least in the musculoskeletal modeling. So now we look at um, uh, what I just presented and all of this looks very artificial. All of this data was collected in the laboratory. We bring the patients in, we train them how to do the activity, we coach them, we, uh, we put all this gear on these patients and then we publish this data as if this is what patients do every day in their lives. And this is an extreme example, but look at this patient. I mean, he's on a treadmill, we're doing fluoroscopic analysis, but EMG has got motion sensors, um, uh, video motion uh, skin markers, and we then publish his knee forces saying, this is how patients walk. So the question is, what, have, what do patients do when you're not monitoring them? What do patients do when they're not in the laboratory? And uh, to do that, we had to take our equipment, and this was over 20 kilograms, and then miniaturize it so it could be worn on a belt. And when we gave these to patients, now patients were relatively untethered and could go outside the laboratory and we could monitor uh, their data. So once we did that, we then sent these patients and just gave them general instructions. For example, go out and hike. And they would hike, and then they would do things that we never expected them to do. So when we took all this data, you're looking at the forces now measured indoors in a laboratory, a little over two times body weight, which is relatively low. But when they are outside, forces now begin to change depending on the surface on which they're hiking, whether it's they're hiking uphill or downhill, whether they're hiking in grass or whether they're hiking in, in sand. And here's that one incident of tripping, uh, which generated the highest force that we've ever recorded over five times uh, body weight. So, you know, this begins to question the um, the validity of data that's been collected inside the lab. And I think we need more, we need more unsupervised remote monitoring to uh, make uh, broad uh, conclusions. Uh, here's another example of collecting data outside the laboratory. This is a patient who is skiing. And uh, just like walking, different skiing activities actually generate different results. So here you can see that uh, skiing at beginner level at uh, relatively easy slopes, the, uh, the green slopes, doesn't generate as much um, uh, knee forces. But now when you're good getting up into steeper slopes that approach uh, a black diamond, you're now approaching about five times body weight, putting five times body weight on your knees. So uh, where are we now? 
You know, it's been 15 years since we implanted the first patient and our third generation electronic knee is not, is not in patients yet, but uh, we, this uh, design has onboard power. It has data storage. So what both of, both of these now enable remote monitoring. We don't have to uh, tether the patient to an external power device. We don't have to uh, tether the patient to a, um, to a uh, radio that communicates with a computer that has to travel with the patient. The data is actually in the instrument itself, in the implant itself, and can be pulled out uh, later as needed. Um, our target is uh, a, Jap a Japanese patient population because of the high flexion activities that these patients do that we were unable to collect in our Western uh, population. In addition to uh, forces, we also have now inertial sensors that can measure range of motion so we can get kinematics and kinetics all inside uh, one, um, one uh, device. Implant stability uh, and perhaps even uh, and perhaps even loosening. Um, so here's, here's an example of the patient population that we're interested in. And this is, these patients have not been implanted with the electronic knee, but have been implanted with uh, Smith & Nephew's bicruciate retaining knee. Again, a new design that keeps both cruciate ligaments intact. And so they have an intact ACL. And um, we wanted to know what happens to these ligaments when these patients undergo uh, these deep flexion activities so we did pre-op uh, CT scans and then post-op uh, CT scans and then conducted fluoroscopic analysis, both pre-op and post-op while they were squatting and sitting cross-legged. Uh, we used a software program called uh, the Vivo Sim, and it's difficult to see on the slides, but uh, where you might visualize uh, the ACL and the PCL, you can see some red lines. And the software program uh, generates computer models of ligaments then calculates the forces on the ligaments. So here are the two bundles of the anterior cruciate ligament, and you can see the forces are more active in, early, uh, in the early range of flexion, which is similar to what you expect. Uh, and then here are the two um, bundles of the posterior cruciate ligament, which gets activated more in flexion, again, close to what you, you would expect intuitively, but you begin to see really large forces in, uh, in, in some patients approaching uh, eight, 800 newtons. So this now begins to open up uh, areas where we can, we can start seeing the, um, uh, uh, looking at implants that have not only uh, the collaterals intact, but also the anterior cruciate ligament intact, and whether this is feasible, whether this, these knees are gonna be more stable, and most important, whether they would survive as long as traditional implants. Now, in the last 14 years, there's been tremendous improvement in electronics. And so our power requirements have gone down a thousand fold. It went from milliwatts to microwatts. What's the advantage of this? It now opens up the uh, potential for self-powered devices. You can now use energy harvesting. And so in collaboration with the State University of New York, what we are using is we're using a, um, a, a phenomenon called triboelectric harvesting where the friction generates static electricity. And uh, with each cycle of walking, uh, the compression at the, in the implant actually generates a small charge, which is then harvested and used to power the implant itself. And uh, at the present, uh, we're not in patients, obviously, but we now have an implant design that can be placed in between the polyethylene and the tibial tray. It requires no external power once it's been implanted. Uh, Orso sensor is also working on a commercial um, uh, tibial tray that's been instrumented. And um, their um, sensors are unique. So in addition to force, they're looking at sensors that can detect infection, that can measure strength of the bone, and that can also be placed in between the bone and the implant. And so they can do an interface analysis. Uh, another company, Canary Orthopedics, is partnering with um, Zimmer and putting out a uh, uh, commercial tibial tray that's uh, similar to what we have. At the moment, they're only measuring uh, motion, and not forces. So hip and knee arthroplasty are by far the commonest 
joint replacement uh, surgeries, but shoulder, ankle, elbow, wrist, and hand are also emerging. And the complications are much higher in these joints than in, in, in the hip and knee. So at Scripps, what we're doing is developing an instrumented shoulder prosthesis. Here's a long stem that we've instrumented with sensors placed in the neck and with the electronics in the stem. The long stem has plenty of real estate for electronics. And then uh, short stems are becoming more popular. So we're now customizing a short stem design to uh, take our electronics so that we can monitor differences in, in the performance of these two uh, designs. We're also looking at instrumenting the glenosphere in a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And also now stemless designs are becoming, are, are becoming an emerging, emerging interest. Um, on the wrist, we are collaborating with Brown University with their uh, wrist, um, total wrist arthroplasty uh, implant design. And here the challenge obviously is fitting all the electronics within the small radial component. And so we have customized the radial component to hold our uh, electronics. And uh, what we have done is created uh, a, a capsule that encapsulates our telemetry electronics and put these sensors on a tube inside the uh, radial uh, component itself. Uh, this is a new frontier for us, um, replacing um, the trapezium in uh, CMC joint arthritis. And uh, this is a technical challenge. We, we are using a polymeric implant design and the two implant uh, sensing devices, designs that we're looking at is a sensing tube that has sensors inside the tube and a, a diaphragm where the sensors are under the diaphragm. Well, we're not sure yet which one of these are going to be uh, feasible. Uh, and other challenges, for example, loading the base of the thumb is a challenge and we have to use robotic arms to calibrate these devices, calibrate these sensors. So where are we now? What is the future? I mean, we've made tremendous strides in sensors. Uh, electronics, there have been, uh, you know, uh, the electronics have become more sophisticated. Power is no longer of much concern now, and we believe that we can do remote monitoring. And artificial intelligence and machine learning is now developing to the point where it can take, it can make use of all the data is being collected. So where do we, where's the tipping point? When does uh, smart implants become as common as smartphones? And perhaps, this uh, pandemic would be uh, the nudge that we need to get to that uh, tipping point. So I'll end my talk right now with this prediction that we will be seeing a paradigm shift in how patients are being treated. Um, I just don't know when that's gonna happen. And smart implants are gonna become as commonplace as smartphones. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, friends and colleagues. Um, Suri, who actually was my senior at, uh, at Sion Hospital and was one of the reasons why I uh, decided to pursue orthopedics in, in residency. Uh, Abhay Narvekar, who was my lecturer when I was a resident and taught me most of my surgical skills. Uh, Dr. Lard, who was an exemplary professor, um, a great surgeon and also a tremendous athlete uh, C.J. Tucker, who helped me in my practice, and uh, I, I used to learn from him by assisting him in his practice, and uh, Dr. Caldwell, who uh, gave me a job in research and taught me all the research activities and has been a huge mentor for me in the U.S. Uh, I'd like to um, shout out to my friend Shantanu, who joined me as a research fellow in my laboratory, but is now a professor at SRM Institute of Technology. Shantanu actually collected most of the data on the smart implants and smart instruments that I presented today. Um, thank you again, appreciate this great uh,